Um, relevant to today's conversation, prior to joining the law school, Professor Krauss Phelan was an assistant public defender in Kent County. And Professor Langham served 25 years as a law enforcement officer prior to becoming an attorney, was public assistant, was a pub, assistant public defender, and served as deputy legal counsel and policy advisor for Governor Jennifer Granholm's administration. As I've said before, if you've been here, um, that this is a conversation implying your participation. So we encourage you to ask questions by posting them in the chat while our guests are making their comments and we'll try to get as many in as we possibly can. Um, we'll be recording today's program. If you are not speaking, please mute your audio so as not to be distracted to others. So let's get the conversation started as a launching point. Um, this is a question for both of you. Um, I don't know, Professor cross if you want to start us off. What drove you toward the, your, your career in criminal law broadly defined? Honestly, I think how I grew up is what drew me to criminal defense. I am a product of Michigan. Um, I was raised for most of my childhood by a single mom with two siblings. My mom had to work three jobs to support us, and it was lean most of the time. And I saw how my mom was treated differently because we, what would now be classified as working poor. Um, and I saw the way that we were treated differently because we didn't have means. And I just remember thinking that that was right. It wasn't fair. And I can remember as a small child having this innate sense of what was fair and what wasn't fair. Um, and then fast forward to when I was about 13 years old, there was a television show called Kate McShane. It only aired one season. And of that one season, I only saw one episode. And um, Ann Mira played the main character. And she was a female lawyer. And for those of you, most of you may remember who Ann Mira is. I have to tell my students, the younger generation, that she's Ben Stiller's mom, but <laughs> that was a um, She was a defense attorney. And you have to understand, as old as I am, when I was 13, to see on television a woman playing a criminal defense attorney was pretty out of the ordinary. And in this particular episode, the woman uh, was representing a young man accused of murder and everybody in the back uh, in the town turned their back on him. And I just remember knowing that was a defining moment for me. That's when I knew that I wanted to stick up for people who couldn't speak for themselves. And I would do that by being a criminal defense lawyer. Uh, fast forward, I also am fascinated by the criminal justice system. I always have been from the time I was a young kid. And so even though I knew I wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer, I decided that I wanted to get my degree in criminal justice. So that's what I did. My undergrad degree is in criminal justice. And from that point on, I've spent my entire career up until becoming um, a professor in the criminal justice system as a public defense attorney. Uh, so that's how I came to be a lawyer. Did you have a, um, a particular case that that verify your choice to be in this profession? Absolutely. Um, and I was quite well into my career by this point, but I represented a young African-American woman who came into my office out of the blue one day. She was about 21 years old, and she said, um, they think I killed my baby. And I said, what do you mean they think you killed your baby? Who thinks you killed your baby? And from there, it unfolded very quickly that her um, two-month-old baby had died, and the police were accusing her of being the person who committed the crime. And she didn't have, at that point, I was in private practice, but still did um, indigent defense as well. And she did not have the means to represent her, or to hire a lawyer. And so she actually retained me for the pre-charge investigation for the whopping total of five dollars because that's what she had on her and as fate would have it the court system appointed me to represent her which once the charging decision was made and after her spending a year in jail while we continued to do investigation and preparing the defense and losing through the court system her son um, my investigator and I mounted a very aggressive defense, and she was found not guilty. 
And it was that moment that if there had ever been any doubt in my mind that what I was doing was what I was called to do, that that erased any doubt that I might have had. Amazing. Certainly a validation of everything, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, Professor Langham, you were a police officer, public defender, worked in the, in the Jennifer Granholm administration in, this, in the, the criminal area. What led you to the profession? Well, I, as you just indicated, I started out uh, in state police, and um, um, I spent most of my time, well, 22 of my 25 years, I spent in the criminal investigative division. So I worked in narcotics, undercover narcotics officer, narcotics in Detroit, wow. and organized crime. So after I knew that I was going to um, retire after those 25 years, so I was looking forward to that a uh, glorious second career, and I found it at uh, uh, Thomas M. Cooley Law School. Um, I was working five days a week um, as a detective lieutenant, um, eight to five, and I went to school at Cooley every single weekend, year-round, for three years in one term um, until I graduated. And I was still in the state police, um, completing my 25-year stint for about a year, year and a half, and then I retired. I was offered a job after interviews with the as an assistant attorney general under the Granholm administration. Um, she was governor elect at the time, okay. and I was offered a job, and I had to turn the job down because I had to accept it in December of that given year, and and I wasn't able to because I was f approximately 45 days shy of retiring. So I turned down the offer. They knew exactly why. We discussed it. She became the governor. I'm now retired. I immediately opened up a law practice for six months out of Southfield criminal defense, and I did some estate planning and um, a divorce, a couple of divorce cases. And, um, and I eventually got a call and went to the public defender's office because one of my colleagues that I attended Cooley Law School with told the public defender um, that I know this guy that he's, a, you know, state police and, you know, and they hired me. And I, I went there and, and stayed there for about three years or so and um, got a call from the governor's office and ended up being at the governor's office. And I ended up taking that particular position as her uh, deputy legal counsel and criminal justice policy advisor. Have you been watching her on the debates, commentating? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> she loves to stir it up. Yeah, um, all the time. You know, you know, you were a police officer uh, for a long time. Um, is it possible for you to compare and contrast when you started on the force, you know, a number of years ago to kind of what you see now in police and yeah. enforcement? It, yeah, it's some small, some of the things are small and, and, and from when I first started, and this was a million years ago. Um, I never, as when people were arrested, for example, when I would arrest people and other officers would arrest individuals, we never arrested anyone for resisting and obstructing. It was kind of expected that no one was going to go along necessarily peacefully. So that was a charge. I can't ever remember charging people with resisting and obstructing arrest. And I just read something recently. Um, I can't remember one of the prosecutor's office. I think it's, I can't remember which prosecutor's office, but they said they will not issue resisting and arrest, uh, resisting and obstruction charges unless there's video footage of it. Um, yeah. I don't remember this much. You know, I mean, there's always conflict with, with the police and the public. I mean, that's a given. I mean, it, you know, they you get sent into situations where you have to take some type of usually some type of physical action if you're taking someone into custody. And, you know, the most upstanding citizen in the world doesn't want to go to jail. So there's confrontation that's kind of built into the law enforcement. But what I'm seeing now is is, is a little bit it's a lot different than what I've experienced in my career. Um, um, the public resenting the police, maybe the police resenting the public. This is this is a whole new area that's kind of just grown and it's a lot different um, yeah. as far as, you, you wouldn't expect to be sitting in a patrol car and something happened to you for no reason under most circumstances. So it's, it's a lot of tension between the public and law enforcement right now that wasn't present. Can you identify a turning point that in, in that change, when that change occurred, um, is it LA? 
the turning point at which which point in time? Where, where you saw kind of the switch from, you know, you would never thought of, of charging someone with oh, resisting yeah. that. It, it's, that been was... within, it's been within the last 15, 15 years um, mm -hmm. that I started seeing things um, change. And, 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 it, and it was kind of disheartening. And, you know, you're kind of torn between, you know, both facets, you know, who's right, who's wrong. Um, did the police go overboard, um, you know, because they were agitated by the public? Um, is that the, was that their training? Um, that wasn't their training. You you were trained not to respond and react just because the public is is saying things to you. But I think individual officers allow their personal um, personal um, attitude to get involved in it, and it, and it can cause some trouble at times. Yeah, we're gonna, we want to get in a little bit more into that in a second, Pro Professor Kraus Phelan. You know, we see a lot of refrains out there about defunding police. Um, on, you know, protest signs and people chanting and political figures getting a ton of pressure to defund the police. Um, in your mind, what does defunding the police really mean? And is it, is, do the, does the general public have an accurate perception of what that actually means? Well, I mean, first we have to start with the idea that, that every police department across this country is funded differently. Not every police department is funded in the same way. So let's start there. Um, that has to be taken into consideration. But to say defund the police, in my estimation, is a misnomer. Although, let's take a step back for a second. I mean, when we go back to the beginning of this country, there, there were no professional police officers. The idea of professional police officers evolved over time. And originally in the colonies, members of the community would be deputized and take turns patrolling. And, and so I wanna take a sidestep if I can, um, Paul, and just talk about for a second, the evolution of law enforcement in this country, because where we are today with the public perception of police has been a slow and steady creep or just a crawl, or maybe a sprint, depending on your point of view. But if you, if you start all the way back, that we started with deputized members of the public, and then we have the whole historical uh, time period of the slave patrol in the South as the precursor of law enforcement, where their job was to work for the slave owners and make sure that the slaves were armed because they were fearful of revolution. I mean, that is part of the history of law enforcement in this country. And if you don't believe me, you can go and look at the Law Enforcement Historical Society's website. They have that on their front page right now, and it's been up there for a year, well before the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor situation. And then over time, you started to see especially around the time of the Industrial Revolution, things really started to pick up with needing law enforcement to be more than just deputized members of the community where we needed people to help enforce things as communities grew to keep order. So over time, what we saw is as police forces grew, the needs of what the community needed them to do evolved as well. And then when the funding of police becomes a political issue and part of the budget discussions of any governmental unit who controls that police department, that's where things have become murky. And starting with about the Nixon administration, there was a huge push on, on that administration's part to target minorities, particularly for drug crimes. And that's when we started to see this slow and steady creep of militarization come into law enforcement. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I, I will say, and I, I say this every single day, and I see that um, Raphael is, is on with us today, and he was in my criminal procedure class a while back. I am the first to say that we need law enforcement, we need to have law enforcement, 
We need to respect law enforcement because they help keep an ordered society. And they have the courage to put on a badge and strap a gun and go out there and say, on my watch, you will be safe. And I think that needs to be said a little bit more often. But as has happened, over time, police have become more militarized. And when you look at the way police officers dress today, when you look at the way they're trained today, when you look at the equipment that they drive around today, not every department, don't misunderstand me, um, there's a very different look and feel to law enforcement. So for some people, and I know this is a very long way of getting to the point, but for some people, defunding the police simply means let's reallocate the funds. Do they really need to have Humvees to drive around a rural community street? Do they really need to train all these combative ways for the average beat cap? We're always going to need SWAT teams. We're always going to need tactical units for those emergent, very violent situations. But not every police officer doing patrol needs to operate in that, that way. So that's what defunding means to some people. For others, there's no question. There is this misunderstanding out there that defunding means, hey, let's wipe out police altogether. Let's have a public safety or a citizen board. And I don't think with as many people that live in this country, we can ever get to that point. There may be some small communities that might be able to have pure um, public safety officers or community policing in that aspect. Um, but for most, and even most police departments, and as a matter of fact, I'm on an advisory council for the chief of the Grand Rapids Police Department right now, and we just had this very conversation last evening. For many people, defunding is more accurately described as redirecting or reallocating funds, resources, and training to make law enforcement more um, commensurate with community needs. Do either of you have a sense of where the threshold should be in the, in defunding? I mean, because because there's it seems to me, and maybe this is just my perspective, that there's a disconnect between when people are chanting defund the police and kind of what maybe the people that are making the decision understand that to mean. I mean, is there a threshold where that 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 the how far do we push the defunding in order to keep our community safe? So where's that threshold in your mind, Lou or Tanya? Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, I think it's two prong. I, I think when I first heard defund the police, my initial thoughts were, what the heck do they mean by that? Because no one defined it. It just came out. It was said, and it was never defined exactly as to what it what what it actually what was the meaning of it. Um, it's going to be difficult. This is what I see. The organizations that want to defund law enforcement, that's where it starts. They want some of those dollars is what they want. But they want some of those dollars to go exactly where they want them to go, whether that's in building community centers or something in the public domain that they want to be up and running. Um, in the community. So take dollars from law enforcement and move them into community programs, whatever those programs would be recreational or otherwise. So even if they remove some of those dollars, if the dollars aren't allocated to where they want them to go, then no one's still going to be happy on that other side. Um, I don't look at it as as, 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 as Professor um, uh, cross Phelan said, I don't look at it as taking money away from the police and there not being any police departments. I think everyone realizes no one's going to ever go down that road and have that actually happen. So I just think it's just a matter of retraining, training police, and as I mentioned before um, in, some of the, in some of the other presentations I've been involved with, that it starts at the beginning with, with, with background checks and making sure that you don't only speak with the people that were references of these particular law enforcement officers that want to become law enforcement officers, I should say. You want to speak to others that in the community that, that weren't listed as references. We need to know a little bit more about who we are allowing into 
law enforcement so that we don't get to areas where we're talking about um, defunding the police because of actions they've taken that have made individuals, and rightfully so in a lot of cases, resent what they've been doing. And that can't continue. Something has to change. And the question becomes, what has to change? Right. You know, we, there, and there's a sort of a continuum between, you know, an emphasis on community policing and, and providing community services to to help us, um, our communities be safe and, and, and people feel like they're safe and, and they actually are, to, you know, recently we've seen military brought in in situations when typically law enforcement would handle it. Um, do we ever think we would see this end of the continuum as part of law enforcement? Either one of you? Yeah. That had, it, it's not normally when the federal government comes in, they come in at the invitation of the local departments, whether it's state, county, or city. There was no invite here. Um, there was nothing that was something where someone said, well, the local police, state police, county sheriffs can't handle this. That wasn't the case. This was just something that was done to make a point about something other than assisting um, in what was actually taking place. There was really no need for that and it had nothing to do with helping law enforcement. If the state does not ask for your assistance from the federal government, then they obviously don't need it. So what was the real purpose in providing that federal, um, federal intervention, I should say? Yeah. Professor Cross family how is, um body cams and cell phones changed the policing process? It has changed the policing process. Um, I was actually startled when I learned last night how much of the chief's budget goes for um, buying, maintaining, processing, storing um, body cameras. That was a fascinating piece of information for me. But um, I think what has happened is it has brought a higher level of accountability and it has made the public aware of what members of the community have been saying for a long, long time. Look, I was a, a, I was a defense attorney for nearly 18 years before I started teaching both public defense, indigent defense, and retain. And I started practicing in 1989, and I can't tell you how many times a client would say to me, hey, the police roughed me up, or they did this, or they did that. And when it comes down to their word versus the police officers, usually the criminal justice system believes the police officer's words over a defendant. That's reality. And now, with the advent of cell phone cameras and body cameras, we now get to see oftentimes in real time some of the things that are happening and you need not go too deep in your memory to go beyond what we've seen with George Floyd, right? So we're seeing it as it's happening. And I think that has made police more accountable. It's raised public awareness that there are some issues that need to be addressed. On the flip side of that coin, it's also allowed the community to see some really cool things that law enforcement does, right? Because at the end, at the end of the day, there are a lot of wonderful officers out there doing a lot of good work and a lot of good for the community. And so we get to see those things too. It's you know, I want to hear... Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say it's helped in cases too, and I'm sure... Judge Green may want to um, jump in on this one as well, but there are times with, when what's on that video camera is very helpful to one side or the other in a particular case. And so it's helped with criminal investigations and trials, I believe, as well. Mm -hmm. On both sides. Yes. Exactly. Yes. exactly. Judge, do you want to comment at all on, on in the courtroom how, how video has changed the game? It, well, it has dramatically, uh, and I agree with Tanya on that. And, and it, putting aside for a moment how it affects the, the, the litigation, uh, it, I agree with Tanya that it has made law enforcement more accountable. There is no question in my mind, I was a prosecutor, federal prosecutor for 16 years before becoming a judge for now six years, 
And I've seen a lot of law enforcement officers, the vast majority of whom are wonderful people who are putting their lives on the line to keep all of us safe. And, and literally they leave their house in the morning, not knowing if they're gonna come back to their families or not. And we need to find ways of supporting those who are good cops. But we also have to find a way, as, as someone pointed out here, of, of making sure that those who are becoming law enforcement officers have not only the skills, but the judgment uh, to be law enforcement officers. It's an incredibly difficult job to be a law enforcement officer. It should be an incredibly difficult job to be a law enforcement officer. And I say that with many friends who are in law enforcement who I think appreciate that because we are talking, we are asking law enforcement to keep us safe. We are also demanding and should expect that law enforcement are going to protect our constitutional rights. Those are sometimes seems to be at odds, but they shouldn't be. I think over time with the cameras and recording ability, and this is also true of audio recording of interviews. I'm, I was long a critic of the FBI, who for a long time, as Tanya knows, had a strict policy, they would not record interviews. So they're interviewing people they've arrested, uh, and they would not record them. And, and over and over again, that created a problem. And, and I, I, I don't wanna spend the time going into all the reasons why they didn't, didn't do it, but they've now backed away from that. And, and it's always better if you've got a video recording, if you have an audio recording, then no one has, has who is a fact finder, whether it's a judge or a jury, has to worry about how to figure out what happened. We know what happened. And as Tanya pointed out, we've now seen some heinous crimes that have been committed by law enforcement that shock and appall all of us and should. But we also have now had an opportunity to see some pretty cool things where they've saved the lives of babies or or maybe something as simple as, you know, helping to, to buy a bicycle for uh, a waitress who had her stolen. So we're going to see the good and the bad, but I think in the long run, it's going to pay dividends for us. Yeah, anyone, I think it was yesterday in, in one of my news feeds where I saw that one of the officers involved in the George Floyd's case, there was some video um, audio recording of his of his testimony. Um, did anybody else see that besides me? Basically, he uh, and I'm going to paraphrase significantly here. He he indicated that he had indicate he had reached out to his fellow officers and said maybe we should turn him over before. Um, you know, before he, he passed away. Um, and I know it's dangerous to forecast outcomes in, in situations like this, but when you provide testimony under oath, something like that, in a very volatile situation like the George Floyd case and his murder involving police, and you have one of the officers coming out and saying, I told my colleagues to turn him over. Moving on from maybe policing, and we can stay in policing a while because I want to talk about how race relates to policing and all that kind of stuff. But, but what's a likely outcome? What influence will that statement have on on the, the deliberation of his of his that particular officer's case? Anybody want to surmise? Paul, if I could surmise how a jury would interpret yeah. that or what they would do with it, I would create an app and I would go on Shark Tank with it. Um, it, it's hard to say what, first of all, it's hard to say if it's going to be admissible, number one, and, and okay. secondly, um, what impact that will have on the jury. I know that that particular officer's lawyer was pretty assertive from the get-go about um, saying that his client was different than, than the others, um, but now everything is different. The, the times have changed. And I do think that the jury, when they have the picture of what we've seen real time as it was happening, and you put that statement alongside with it, I do think it will have an impact on the jury. Whether that's enough uh, for the prosecutor to obtain a conviction in that case or not, I don't know. You know in this history, there's a very low percentage of convictions if, first of all, there's a very low percentage of officers that ever get charged. And then if they are charged, there's a very low percentage of conviction. So it, it's hard to say. I don't know, Lou, do you, do you want to jump in on that one? 
No, I, I agree with you. <laughs> those are the facts. Uh, they they are. Those are those are the facts. Is without and, and without the video footage, one would never know. Now we talked about the video footage. Uh, the judge uh, brought it up too. Um, and I've had clients, one particular client, and I'll just um, say it this way. I, it was questionable who charged who once the police exited the vehicle and my client was outside of his vehicle. The story from the police was that my client charged them. The, the story from my client was I was standing there, we were talking, they were telling me what I did wrong. And they uh, they ran forward and jumped on me and knocked me down. So I'll say it this way: um, there was a plea because it wasn't, and I'm surprised about this. It wasn't exactly the way my client said it was. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and <laughs> <laughs> so once the, once I showed my client the video footage, I think we were done within ten minutes because it was just the opposite and what was explained to me. So it works both ways. You know, we see law enforcement being on the wrong side of these things and, and, and on the other end of it. So I think it protects both sides. You know, and, I, and, and in fact, uh, th there is video footage of, of this particular officer who I think was the first responder um, who, drew, who, draw, who drew his gun thinking that because he couldn't see one of George Floyd's hands and he was concerned that he might have a gun. And that might lead us to the issue of race um, and it, how what, what role that plays in, in policing and law enforcement in general. I don't know where the right question or, or even where to begin, but we know that we have a disproportionate number of black Americans incarcerated. We know that we see video, video more times than not when the alleged perpetrator is, is a person of color. Um, you know, my wife and I often contact driving down 96. I've started to take a little bit of a tally as we see people that are getting pulled over on 96 driving from Detroit to the Lansing area. Disproportionately, it appears to me that there are a number of people that are um, black Americans. So what do we what do we do about that? I don't know what I don't even know what the question should be, but the influence or the the impact of race on the whole policing process. Anyone want to comment on that? Well, my initial thoughts are very briefly, and I've always felt this way. I've always felt that uh, people, all people of different races and nationalities should be involved in the system itself. Um, so, I mean, that was my reason for joining the state police. I, I, didn't, know one, I didn't know one single person in Michigan State Police. All I knew was that they have something going on. I don't know anybody that can tell me about it. And the only way I can find out is to join. So I wanted to be part of that system as much as I wanted to be part of the legal system as a lawyer. We need people. When I, I was a detective lieutenant and, you know, for most of my career. So I was in charge of street activities because I was out there with my sergeants and my officers. So I could control everything. Um, I wasn't concerned so much with my officers doing anything um, overhanded as related to someone of another race because I was there and they knew how I would respond and how I would do things. So it was impossible for them to even consider um, exerting any extra force on anyone doing a raid and I've done hundreds of raids, narcotic raids. So that wasn't going to happen because I was there. And it's not because it was me, it's basically because of the color of my skin. It could have been anyone. So we need to be part of the system. I don't want things to be so anti-police that minority candidates don't want to join the police department. You, you can't see everything from the outside. You need people on the inside. My son joined the state police over a year and a half ago. Um, you need to be part of the system just to see what's going on and see what you can do to influence. And, and as Professor uh, uh, Cross Phelan was, was saying earlier before he got started. So I made the decision after speaking with one of my other colleagues to start teaching at the uh, Regional Police Academy um, um, up in the Lansing, Jackson area um, to possibly have some influence there 
in the way officers are trained and taught to do things. So if I can bounce off that, I mean, the reality is that the way police are trained right now, and, and, and you can ask police officers, ask them, how are they trained? And most of them will admit, and I had three of them admit at the meeting last night, that right now we are at a militarized state, right? And what I mean by that is that we are viewed, and I say we as the community, are viewed as enemy combatants. And we then become, we, if we play as the community, if we play the role, then we view police as occupiers, right? So that is an inherent tension right there. And that comes from the way they're being trained. Now, having said that, if we take a step back, you don't have to go to a whole community policing model to embrace community, the certain aspects of community policing. And to lose point, the police force needs to look like the community they're, they're, that they're policing, pure and simple. They need to look like the community that they're policing. Because at the end of the day, the criminal justice system is a community contract. The legal system is a community contract. We agree as members of the community that the community creates the laws, our elected officials create the laws, we agree that we're going to follow them, and we accept that if we don't follow those rules, that law enforcement and the system are going to hold us accountable and we receive consequences. And the flip side of that societal contract is that law enforcement is going to serve and protect us. They're part of the com community contract. And we need to get law enforcement back to the mindset that they can serve and protect us and still view themselves not as somebody to come in and control us, but they're going to come into the community and serve and protect us. So it all goes back to relearning what the community contract in the legal system means. The police need to relearn that, the community needs to relearn that, and quite frankly, the legal system needs to relearn that. So many police departments around the country right now, they are having conversations with the stakeholders in their communities. And they're finding out, how do you view us? What do you need from us? What do you want police to do? How, how do you expect us to be nice to you, but still protect you and to catch the bad guys, right? So that's where certain aspects of community policing can come into play. So maybe having citizen parking meters as opposed to having law enforcement spend their time with that, bringing in social workers to help in certain situations that deal with children or domestic violence, for example. Now, domestic violence, I'm gonna put a footnote on that one, and I'm really telling people to caution on that because any police officer will tell you that <clears throat> an officer's greatest risk of being killed in the line of duty is when they're, when they're effectuating an arrest. And that number goes up exponentially while while effectuating a domestic violence arrest. So I think we have to be really cautious about domestic violence cases. But having said that, um, there are so many things that the community can come in and help the police with. And that's what departments around the country right now are exploring, is how much can we share responsibility with other organizations and other members of the community in keeping the community safe? And if the police will accept that, if law enforcement will accept that, then the whole relationship dynamics can change. Now, the officers that were at the meeting I was at last night with the Grand Rapids uh, police chief, they also admitted that it starts with training because they said they're going to have a hard time getting their newer, younger officers to buy into any of this shifting or refocusing of a community aspect of policing because the militarized aspect of training has been so instilled in them. And, and my response to them was, well, you know what? You have a conversation with the academy. You have a conversation with MCOLs. You have a conversation with every Michigan institution 
that gives associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees in criminal justice, and you say to them, we're refocusing training. You need to refocus the training and education you're giving to criminal justice majors, or we're not going to hire your grads. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Interesting. Um, uh, Professor Langham mentioned this. What, what are what are some advice that we could give to communities to in in ways to, to diversify the applicant pool for law enforcement officers? To increase the applicant pool? To, to, yeah, to be have it be more diverse. I should said I should have said more diverse. The, the 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 most effective way for it to work is to have law enforcement officers go into the actual communities where the individuals that they're recruiting um, are, are living. Um, you can't, when, back when I joined, I had to physically go to the state police post in Detroit to go and, 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 and sign up. But I think law enforcement officers need to actively go into the community and recruit actually on the streets um, where the people are on a daily basis and start the recruitment process there because it, it, it the, the distance between the two of uh, going to uh, police department headquarters and the community, they're this far apart. If you get yourself in the community and actually go to where in the neighborhood is when I'm actually in the neighborhood and say we are recruiting and we want to talk to you if you want to join us to make our department a better department, we need you to be involved. And I think that's a good way to start um, with the law enforcement uh, and, aspect. And it makes a ton of sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a good place to start, but the flip side to that is where you started the conversation, Paul, and that is there is a disproportionate number of black men who are arrested, convicted, and sent to prison disproportionate. And when you start doing the statistical analysis backwards, in other words, you start looking at where are law enforcement targeting their investigatory law enforcement activities. And there's a high percentage of poor communities, minority communities that get targeted. Lay that next to the statistic that 5%, 5 to 10% of average police department's time is spent on violent crime. That makes it a hard pill to swallow to say that, well, we go to those communities because that's where all the violent crime is. The statistics don't jive with one another. So there has to be, we have to figure out what the point is because if I'm a minority, if I'm a black male, and you come to me and say, join the police force, I'm not going to be real inclined to do that because you're putting my people in prison at a disproportionate rate. So if, if we can get law enforcement to actively, visibly articulate that they are invested in the communities that they are policing, where they have to be accountable to the public that they are serving, then I think you might get communities buying into, okay, maybe we do want to be police officers. Maybe we do want to help the police force look more like the community. But it's, it's tough. Yeah. You know, um, community policing, as I look back, was in vogue you know, in late early, early 90s, I remember I had a police chief friend who was trying to implement a, a community policing program in their community, and it was so hard to do. It was such a slow process. So, and we can't just flip a switch. If we if we say the police is, is militarized, and, and part of the answer is to move to more com uh, a community policing model, how does that occur in, in real time? I mean, you just can't say, okay, tomorrow this is what we're going to do. And you, you alluded to this a little bit with the training and, and whatnot moving forward, but how, do, how would one community go about moving to a, a community policing model? I think the public really has to understand that. I think the most aggressive models I'm, I'm hearing police chiefs talk about right now is a three-year plan. Most departments, especially ones who don't have a lot of financial resources, that can be a five- to seven-year plan. 
to be able to completely integrate to a different model. But uh, right now, the plan is um, to have about a three-year plan to get to all of all of the things Chief Payne wants to initiate for uh, the Grand Rapids Police Department strategic plan. So you start with training and you start with community buy-in and let the community take responsibility for some of this too. That's an important aspect of any community policing model is that the community has to buy in and they have to accept responsibility too. Um, and, and a lot of departments that have tried community policing in the past, for example, we're now in Grand Rapids, we went through three chiefs. Um, Chief Haggerty at the very end of his tenure started to lay the groundwork for community policing. Uh, Dolan came in from Boston and he really implemented um, several aspects of community policing. And one of the ways he started was in the downtown area as it was going through the Renaissance and growth period, he put cops on bikes and they'd ride around the city. Um, and then uh, Chief Rahinsky really tried to implement some more community policing aspects, but it has to be done correctly, methodically, and it's a very detailed strategic plan to get a department to a community uh, model. And then the other thing that's important to remember is that there are several different models of what community policing is. There's, there's no one universal model for community policing. So a particular community, a particular department has to decide, A, do we want to be completely community policing? Do we want to be a hybrid model of community policing? And what, if so, what model are we going to use? And who are our community stakeholders that we need to get involved in part of this program? So I think that's something that the country has to understand. There's no one size fits all for this concept of community policing. I'm glad I didn't ask my question I was going to ask before about defining what community policing is because there is no one, obviously no one definition. Um, we have a few minutes left and I, I, I didn't want to leave today's um, conversation with just talking about access to justice as a, as a general concept. Um, we know that a number of um, communities are underserviced in terms of legal services. Um, we know that um, a lot of folks just don't have access to representation and um, defense and, and um, advice, counsel. Uh, what are your, both of, for both of you, um, what does access to justice mean to you and how do we work toward achieving it? Well, I, I think recently um, here in the state of Michigan, for example, um, we, with the Michigan Indigent, uh, Michigan Indigent Defense Council, um, you have to have representation at the initial stage, at your initial arraignment. So you have attorneys now that are representing criminal defendants. We've always had criminal defendants that were represented at trial, um, free of charge um, right. because of, of that. But now they're represented from the very, very beginning at their initial arraignment when they're first advised what the charges are against them. They have lawyers there representing them on day one to make sure that there's someone that is telling them, other than the judge, um, what the charges are against them and what the potential penalties are, but more importantly, someone to argue bond for them, to explain to the court from the mouth of the attorney as to my client will in fact show up at the next court appearance, Your Honor. They just received a job. They've been working for two months. They can't afford the $500 cash bond to get out or whatever it happens to be. And they've instructed me and told me that they will appear for every court appearance. You need someone to argue on their behalf so that at the very initial stages, you aren't incarcerated because you don't have $500 to post by. Um, so I think that's a good thing. And I think that helped to get us off to, uh, to a good start. Yeah, at, you know, Mich Michigan was ranked fourth from the bottom, fourth from the bottom of the 50 states in the way it provided indigent defense services. 
And that's unacceptable. And I give former Governor Snyder a lot of props for getting the process started to create the indigent defense um, council system and those plans are being implemented as we speak and new defenders offices are being created um, around the state of Michigan. And I'm, I proudly say that many of our graduates have been hired to work in those offices and are doing just a bang up job. But, but let me just say this, not everybody who handles indigent defense is a true believer like I am. Um, and when you do not pay indigent defense counsel well, you get a whole host of types of lawyers that decide to handle indigent defense cases. And it's not always the best representation. And I can speak truth to this because I did indigent defense services in both the state and federal system. And in the federal system under the Criminal Justice Act, it is determined how much panel lawyers, that's what they call lawyers in the federal system who handle court appointed cases, how much they're paid. Now you don't make a fortune handling federal cases, but you're paid a decent wage and you're paid for your time. In the state system, it's getting better with the new indigent defense system. Uh, but before that, it depended what county you were on and it, it was bad. It was really bad. So until we take seriously that the people, the lawyers representing those people who have the hardest access to legal services are valuable, and that their time is worth just as much as as other lawyers and let's keep it in the criminal context their time is as worth as much as the prosecutor handling the case um there there will continue to be an imbalance in representation and so i'm a strong believer in and Judge Green might want to speak to this, but the federal system is far superior um, to the state system when it comes to how it treats its panel lawyers. But it also demands a lot. I mean, it, a lot is expected of indigent defense counsel in the federal system and training is required. And so that's big too. But, but we, we lawyers have to also accept responsibility for continuing to work to ensure that people who need access to justice have it. And that's why we have such a rich tradition of pro bono services in the, the profession. And I'm really proud of our institution's efforts to help train our students um, to not only while their students provide access to justice, but then they carry that, that ethical consideration with them out into the practice. Thank you. That's probably a good place for us to maybe stop this evening. Any any um, final questions for the group tonight? Please join me in thanking Professors Langham and Krauss Phelan for providing us some great I insight. Uh, sure. Uh, sure. sure. I, I, I was, uh, I think the most challenging thing uh, that was said by both Lou and, um, and Tanya was changing the mindset, you know, and not of uh, law enforcement but uh one of the most profound things you said tanya was um how law enforcement started you know the whole idea of this imbalance and it's it's when you said you know we have to go back and it's to 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 getting them to think differently it's kind of like when did they do that you know ever uh kind of thing and so it's um it's I, I just find that to be the most challenging thing with all of this and and when you talk about you know what is it when you're looking at different models of community policing uh and and, and when i sit and i listen to them uh lansing is doing this right now you know uh the lansing uh police chief is looking at how do we do this in lansing and then other cities are doing it minneapolis is all over the place you know it's just it, there's so much, but what you have traditionally is you have law enforcement, they're great law enforcement officers, and there are some that are not. But what you found was 
what you comment on the systemic racism because an officer could do something in Lansing but then go to another city and and start all over again and then go to another city and start all over again and it's just uh you know I do not envy you guys um in, especially Tanya in terms of doing it, it is just it's so frustrating you know and, and it's hard for and especially being an African American and I and I look at that and you and I was listening to the judge saying that you know, law enforcement, when they leave home, they worry about how are they go, are they going to come back to their families. And I remember just growing up as a young black person in the city of Chicago, and that's how you tell your child when they're leaving how you are to interact with law enforcement, how you're to interact. And, and there was so much policing of, of areas, especially where I grew up in the inner city, there's such huge policing that you literally have to tell your kids how to behave and it is a question of whether they come home or not and so it's very it's very frustrating it's frustrating and it's, it's an overwhelming uh challenge for you know for us to try to deal with how how what do you say i uh, in terms of that i know and i agree with with lou where he said you got to have to show up you know in the community they have to see you look like them before they and i think that's number one uh they have to see you look like them before you can get involved uh in terms of that but law enforcement it, that that challenge that you commented on in terms of education it just seems overwhelming to me it will start slowly and one step at a time and one thing that gives me a lot of hope and encouragement mabel and i know that this is controversial in law enforcement circles but as a member of the community, one thing that really gives me hope is, is when we saw police officers marching, walking with protesters, when we saw them taking a knee with protesters, that was a very visible way that they could communicate, I am part of the community. I will support your rights. And little things like that can go a long way. And, and I, I'm sure that your police chief is having the same conversations with the community and the community members on the advisory panel last night were telling Chief Payne the same thing. You have to demonstrate, right? You have to demonstrate that you are part of the community and one step at a time. We have to start somewhere. I created a visual you. of the, uh, the Flint police chief who got a lot of FaceTime on TV for his um, willingness to march with the protesters. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, Professors Langham and Cross Family for being here tonight. My um, pleasure. Thank all, thank all, all, Enjoy. all of our participants. Um, uh, we'll be uh, back again next month. Um, look at look for our date and, and time, um, and we will uh, we will see you that next time. In the meantime, be safe and let's take care of one another. Have a good night. Thank you. Take care, everyone.